Electrolysis is the process of driving a non-spontaneous redox reaction forward using an external source of electrical power or electrical current. To begin thinking about this, I want to refer to a table in your text that reminds us about the relationship between delta G and the sign of the cell potential. When delta G is greater than zero, the cell potential is, is less than zero, that is, the cell potential is negative, and we're in a situation where the forward redox reaction is non-spontaneous. When delta G is negative, the cell potential is positive, and we're in a situation in which the forward reaction is spontaneous. And this is the typical configuration for a galvanic cell, where we're using that negative delta G to produce a positive cell potential and using that potential for electrical work. But when delta G is positive and the cell potential is negative, if we hook up the cell as a galvanic cell, we'll get the reverse reaction occurring, which is often the opposite of what we want. In this case, we can use another configuration, a different type of cell called an electrolytic cell to drive the reaction forward. And the key new player in an electrolytic cell is some source of power, some external source of current that drives the reaction forward. Essentially, this source of electrical power provides the free energy necessary to drive the reaction in the forward direction. One other thing worth mentioning is that if delta G is zero, and this often happens due to concentrations, when the concentrations of reactants and products in the cell are such that delta G is equal to zero, well then the cell potential is equal to zero, and the cell can supply no power or energy. This is what we call a dead battery. And from a thermodynamic perspective, a dead battery is just a battery in equilibrium, right? A battery for which delta G for the redox reaction is equal to zero. As we just mentioned, the configuration for an electrolytic cell is a little bit different from the configuration for a galvanic cell. So it's going to contain a beaker containing usually just reactants, actually, for reasons that will become clear in a second. We're going to have an external power source, such as a battery. And the battery, just like a galvanic cell, in fact, the battery is probably a galvanic cell in and of itself, either that or something from the power grid, is going to have a cathode and an anode within itself. And typically in an electrolytic cell, both electrodes, the cathode and the anode, are dipped directly into a single beaker. Usually the process we want to drive forward is non-spontaneous in the forward direction, and so we often start with just reactants. The example I'm going to use here is aqueous sodium cations combining with aqueous chloride ions, two of them in fact, to form two moles of sodium metal and chlorine gas. Just like in a galvanic cell, oxidation is going to occur at the anode, while reduction is going to occur at the cathode. These metal plates are typically not the metals involved in the redox process, but inert electrodes used to just take up or deliver electrons. If we start with only chloride anions and sodium cations in the solution, which is the typical situation in electrolysis, we're starting with only reactants, then electrons won't flow spontaneously. But the beauty of the external power source is that its purpose in life is to push electrons from the anode to the cathode. So you can think of it like it pulls electrons out of the anode. It literally rips the electrons out of chloride, out of Cl-, and delivers them to Na+, driving this reaction in the forward direction. For electrolytic cells, most of the theoretical and conceptual tools we've already developed apply just as they did to galvanic cells. For example, we can think of an electrolytic cell as two half reactions. And we can unpack the balanced redox equation, the full balanced redox equation, into oxidation and reduction half reactions. So to identify the oxidation, for example, we can notice that chlorine is going from an oxidation state of negative 1 to an oxidation state of 0. That's an increase in oxidation number. That's an oxidation. So the oxidation that's occurring here is 2 Cl- forming chlorine gas, Cl2, and two electrons. Similarly, we can identify the reduction process by noticing that sodium is going from an oxidation state of plus one to an oxidation state of zero. The oxidation number is going down, and so this is a reduction process. Two sodium cations 
are combining with two electrons to form two equivalents of sodium metal solid. We can even use the standard reduction potentials to figure out how much electrical potential the battery needs to supply at standard conditions. So to do that, for example, we would use the same formula we've seen in the past. The standard cell voltage here is going to be equal to the negative of the standard reduction potential for Cl2 plus the standard reduction potential for sodium cation. The sum should end up negative since this reaction is non-spontaneous under standard conditions. That's why we're using an electrolytic cell. And in fact, the value does end up negative. We end up with negative 1.36 volts, 1.36 volts being, being the reduction potential of Cl2, plus the reduction potential for sodium cation, which is negative 0.83 volts on its own, for a final value of negative 2.19 volts. What this means is if we start at equilibrium to get to standard conditions, that is to get to one mole per liter of sodium cation and chloride anion, we need to supply at least 2.19 volts using the connected battery. One final thing that's worth mentioning about the microscopic level is that it's important to realize that oxidation is occurring at the anode and reduction is occurring at the cathode. So the half reactions are physically separated in space just like they are in a galvanic cell. There's a relationship between the number of electrons supplied to an electrolytic cell and the amounts of product formed and reactant consumed. And Faraday's law says that we can essentially use the tools of stoichiometry to figure out from the amount of charge or number of electrons transferred how much product has formed or reactant has been consumed. So to return to our example of sodium cation combining with chloride anion to form sodium metal and chlorine gas, in the course of this process, and we saw this in the half reactions, two electrons are transferred from chloride to sodium cation. And we can treat those two electrons like a, a reactant and use the tools of stoichiometry here. So for example, we could write plus two electrons on the reactant side and plus two electrons on the product side just to remind us that two electrons are transferred. And think about the two, the stoichiometric coefficient here, as part of mole-mole ratios as we've done far in the past in 1211 with regular reagents. Basically what we're doing here is just applying the law of conservation of mass to electrons as well as the actual chemical species involved in the redox process. To actually determine the quantity of electricity that's passed through, we often measure that in coulombs or use the current in amperes. An ampere is one coulomb per second times the time in seconds to get us to the total charge transferred. You're going to see capital Q used for the charge in coulombs in a number of locations. It's important to distinguish that from Q, the reaction quotient. We can then take that charge transferred, Q, and use Faraday's constant, which is in coulombs per mole, to determine the moles of electrons that have been transferred. From there, we just channel stoichiometry to figure out whatever we want to figure out, really, about the amounts of product formed and reactant consumed. So just to think about this in sort of a flowchart format, if we're given the amount of current in amperes that has been supplied over a particular time in, let's say, seconds, we can use that to get to the charge in coulombs. By applying Faraday's constant, we can get to the moles of electrons. From there, using molar ratios, we can get to, say, the moles of product formed or reactant consumed, depending on what we're interested in. And then, if necessary, we can, for example, go to mass or volume, grams or liters of product formed as well, or reactant consumed, for example. And of course, this process can be applied bidirectionally. So if we're given, for example, a mass of product produced, we can go back to the moles of product produced, work backwards to the moles of electrons, work backwards to the charge, and figure out, for example, either the current or the time given one of those two variables involved in an electrolysis process.